Why is your forehead all red? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. You're right. I should have. Episode 5 of Rain. Let's do this. We're in another location. Tetley's here. And you can all watch my curls full flat in real time. So here we are in episode 5. I actually had to remind myself what happened in this episode because the intensity of episodes 7 to 11 are actually so intense that you actually forget what is actually the plot of some of the other episodes. <laughs> what is the big conflict this week? Well, there's the pagans in the woods and there is Francois's ex-girlfriend who has returned to court in yet another scheme by Catherine de' Medici to stop Mary and Francois from marrying. And yes, I've made some fresh iced tea my precious pangalactic gargle blaster. That's the flavour of the tea, by the way. I know what the actual pangalactic gargle blaster is. You don't have to tell me that it's like having your brain smashed out with a slice of lemon wrapped around a large gold brick. Never have more than two unless you're a 40 ton mega elephant with bronchial pneumonia. God, I wish I was watching Hitchhikers. Not the movie, the TV series. Movie shit, TV series good. Life. Don't talk to me about life. No one even mentioned it. So we have Pagans in the Woods, Francois's ex-girlfriend. We have Jermaine slowly coming to accept the fact that she's got a boyfriend who is lower born than her and thinking, mm, why not? Because I don't want to regret what I didn't do in my youth or who I didn't do in my youth. I never actually learned the kitchen boy's name. So if anyone knows his name, please tell me because I either it's never been mentioned until now or I just was not paying attention enough to care. I was too busy gawking at their awful dresses. Also another plot point in this is that Catherine de' Medici is uh, planning to blackmail Amy or Ailey in Mary's letters but it turns out this was just a deliberate attempt to see what Catherine is up to but it really doesn't matter because it's not as if Ailey is going to be at all plot relevant. Because I guess they got five episodes in, they realised, oh shit, we haven't actually done anything with Ailey yet. And seeing as something is supposed to happen to her in three episodes time, we might as well build her up a little bit. Right, the opening scene is Olivia and her maid and uh, in a carriage, and they're on their way to the castle because Catherine de Bidic, she's called her back from where she was living in disgrace for reasons which we'll, we'll later explain. And then um, a man comes onto the King's Road, stops the, they actually call it the King's Road by the way, I'm not just uh, calling it that. Uh, a man comes out of the forest and tells them to take another road through the Bloodwood because the King's Road is flooded. Uh, and the carriage driver takes it as read that this is, that, is tr that this is true. And so he tosses the coin and then he goes into the forest and um, then just as they pulled away, the guy pulls out this little stag pendant, kisses it. Does he kiss it? I don't know. But it's basically it's to show the audience, oh right, this is a trap. All of a sudden the carriage stops and it turns over and Olivia and her maid are like, what the hell's are going on? And they can hear the man getting attacked. Olivia sneaks out of the carriage and then her maid and, and then her handmaid is murdered as well. And then while all this is happening, um, we, we cut to the castle where there are preparations underway for the autumn festival and one of the big MacGuffins is this, um, they make these little boats and they put them out on the river with their regrets tied to the end of the boat and as the boat goes away so does their regrets. And I thought they would set them on fire as well because I thought well if anyone reads that you're in trouble. <laughs> Francois being the, night, being the uh, adorable little himbo that he is gives Mary a boat that he made himself and he christened it and everything and they do this Notting Hill kind of 
kind of dialogue was just like, I'm just a girl, I just want, want to be talking to a boy, not a prince, something like that. It felt very, very Notting Hill. Someone had clearly seen that the week before they wrote the script and were like, I would put that in. That was just such good dialogue. <laughs> yeah, but while this is happening, it's like really dysfunctional with the tone. Like one minute you have like Olivia running through the forest and it's like all grey and scary and dramatic music. And then all of a sudden like, la di da di da, let's get ready for the Harvest Festival. La di da di da. Jermaine is trying to find a rich husband and she's and after the whole failure with the uh, almost prince of portugal she puts her sights on a spice merchant who's traveled far and he's got lots of wealth because spice is a very lucrative business especially now with the opening of the new world unfortunately he's not very fun to talk to because all he talks about is pepper i don't think uh, that was the intention to show that he had a sort of fixation a neurodivergent fixation on pepper and spices and that he I think it was just more that he was really dedicated to his work and unfortunately Jermaine doesn't find this very interesting and she ends up getting wine spilled on her at some point and then the kitchen boy follows her as she goes to try and change her dress and <laughs> like opportunistic bugger like pours the stain remover on the dress and starts copying a feel <laughs> she just says look let me take my dress off in another room and I'll hand it to you you can go and get the stain out and um it's supposed to it's supposed to be this sort of funny scene as he ends up pulling the door open while she's in her underwear and he sees the underwear uh, and he sees basically her shoulders are all exposed and everything and I was like that wouldn't that didn't that doesn't kind of gel because like literally in the scene where you kissed for the first time she was wearing a strapless dress anyway so I thought that was a bit creepy I mean for the most part this guy's actually kind of okay with his relationship with the Germain but um I just felt that was a bit too creepy but like it it depends how she sees it really like if she sees it as charming that's fine if she sees it as creepy I'm I agree <laughs> it's basically it's one of those rom-com things that seem charming on screen but if they did it in real life it'd be like you have a restraining order now so then Olivia shows up just as Mary and Francois are going to have a romantic moment and then Mary's like how do what, what's going on here what have I missed and Bassey comes along and discreetly explains that Olivia and Francois were childhood friends although they were more than friends at some point and she was sent away from court in disgrace after they were discovered and then at some point I can't remember about exactly when but um, Amy is walking through the corridors and she trips it looks like a very deliberate trip and she drops a ring and then just as the ring skitters across the floor it lands at the feet of Catherine de Medici and she picks it up and Ailey is it ought to be like oh no and Catherine notices that the ring is clearly Mary's and Amy tries to say oh I was taking it to her or something like that but Catherine really does not believe her and so so Catherine decides that she is going to blackmail Ailey. Ailey pretends that she is a kleptomaniac saying oh I, I take something sometimes it makes me feel good but uh, it turns out this whole thing was just a ruse because um, Catherine says to Ailey that the letter that she should take the letters that Mary sends home to her mother, Mary de Guise, to her first so she can look at them. Otherwise, she will tell Mary and Ailey will be banished home in disgrace. And it and, uh, turns out this was, in fact, a way of Mary finding out that Catherine is deliberately sabotaging her chances with Francois. I don't know how far it goes after that but like the whole bit where we find out that oh that was all a plan it does show that despite the writing of this series at least Mary Queen of Scots is better at playing the Game of Thrones than Ned Stark <laughs> if only these plot lines actually went anywhere and Bassey at um, either Francois or Mary's insistence goes into the Bloodwood to go and look for the bodies of um, Olivia's coachman and handmade and then he finds both bodies like Colin they're strung up by their feet they're strung up by their ankles with their throats cut and the man is somehow still alive after all this so he cuts the body down despite the guards saying maybe you shouldn't because that will um piss off the pagans but Bassi does it anyway Bassi takes one of the bodies so they can get answers out of the man and Nostradamus tries to heal him but unfortunately the man dies they manage to learn that the pagans worship something that lives in the woods. I don't know what that is because they haven't actually, we, we haven't found out yet as of episode 11, but um, something that feeds on blood. And I just thought, 
it's the chupacabra. <laughs> it's the chupacabra living in the woods. And then at the end of the episode, um, Bassey is confronted by the same boy who um, stopped the carriage on the road, who is actually living in the castle as a butcher's boy. So it shows that the pagans have infiltrated the castle and they're orchestrating stuff. He says to Bassey, uh, like, you have taken two bodies, you know, like you've taken two sacrifices now because he, he took Colin at the, the, the episode two and then now he's got the coachman and he's robbed the people of a sacrifice so he says choose one to kill otherwise we will choose for you and then Bassett tries to in tries to interrogate him but the guy literally says my life is nothing hail Hydra and then he just yeets himself off the balcony and he dies so yes, the pagans are Hydra and they worship the Chupacabra. That is how I assumed things are going until proven otherwise. <laughs> Mary decides to rise above this whole Olivia thing. Even though she's upset by the fact that Francois had a girlfriend, she offers Olivia a dress until her stuff is found. And she is assured that Olivia is just going to be transferred somewhere else. She's just staying at the court very temporarily until she finds out that her stuff is actually being moved into the castle and her jealousy is getting the better of her and unfortunately Olivia is a, being a bitch to her saying that he is only marrying you for obligation he will never give you love and that really gets under Mary's skin <laughs> if I was marrying that point I was just like fine you can't have my dress but still the girls the, the four Marys try to and try to follow Mary's example and, and be kind to her. So later, when they're all sitting together and Ailey is trying to read them some Virgil, uh, Germaine won't shut up about how boring the, the Spice Guy is. Um, and then Olivia comes in and they're talking about her and they have no volume control. <laughs> it's just like, guys, she can hear you. This is a very echoey room. <laughs> like, lower your voices, have a whisper, speak in a different language. So you'll find that there are there are a lot of scenes where these people should be using their inside voice, but there's you can very clearly hear them. It's, it's a bit of a, a bit of a pet peeve I have about some filming where it's just like, where is like, let's have this secret plan, but I'm going, I'm not going to talk like this. I'm going to talk like this, and I don't care if anyone hears us because rain takes place at the French court. You could have established like the four Marys might switch to the actual English language, or they might be switched to Scots even. I mean, I'm not expecting you to speak, to put Scots into the uh, script, but you know, you could just show that like these people ha know what discretion is. And when they start talking in different language, just put subtitles in. Because the four Marys have to be bilingual at least. They must know at least the difference between French and English. Just, just, just saying, I'm just saying. But either way, they try to and be nice to Olivia, but Olivia is um, being manipulated by, again, Catherine de Medici. She's behind everything. She's just, she's she's the little finger of the entire series, apparently. So she calls Olivia back in order to stoke animosity between Mary and Francois, which sort of works, and have um, Francois marry Olivia instead. And that's why she's staying in the castle now. And Mary unfortunately gets really jealous about this and during the the festival Francois and Mary argue about it and then Mary feels bad about getting into an argument thinking she's being too jealous, she's overreacting and she slopes off to the coastline or the, or the water, the water edge. Is this a lake or the sea? I can't tell. I'm just thinking it's a massive lake but it's huge! It's like Lake Michigan. Anyway, she and Bassey start venting and Bassey has a, a jug of uh, alcohol with him that Mary drinks from. She gets drunk and Adelaide Kane is very, is very much acting drunk, like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Am I overreacting? What's wrong with me? Uh, it was so foolish of me to think that we could ever be just a boy and just a girl. And while I am stuck here with with no recourse, he's free to do whatever he wants with whoever he wants. So I says, yeah, if you want that money, come and find it, because I don't know where it is, you baloney. You make me want a wretch. And Basti's just sitting the whole time like, yep, 
and then Mary, being drunk, she snogs Bassy. And then she pulls away and she's like, oh shit, I shouldn't have done that. And he's like, right, you shouldn't. I should have done that. And then he goes in and pulls her in another kiss. This is, this bit made me like go, want to face palm so many times. As they pull away, Francois is standing there and they don't notice him, but he's seen them and he just walks away. And then they got to go and do the boat thing and Francois is giving her the silent treatment. They send off the boats and he just leaves Mary there watching after the boats and he goes after Olivia. Why are there nail clippers here? These aren't mine. And was that everything to do with the thing? Oh, there's Kenna. Sorry, I forgot about Kenna. Kenna, um, who is now the king's mistress, hasn't actually publicised it, but she's wearing jewellery. It's supposed to look very nice, but it looks so plastic. If I wore that, I'd get a, a rash all over my chest because I'm allergic to nickel. That thing looks like it's got nickel in it. But obviously Mary doesn't realise that the necklace is a gift from Henri until Catherine shows up. And Catherine very um, unsubtly says that the necklace was once given to her and then clearly has now been given to Kenna as a sign that she is now the king's mistress and Mary's like, do you know what you're getting into? You know how changeable the king is and Kenna's like, I don't care. This is my decision. I don't need you to lecture me over it even if you are my queen. I'm the king's mistress. There is a bit of animosity there but I think obviously Mary is just trying to look out for her friend while Kenna is just Kenna is very defensive about being judged for being the king's mistress. As, as I said all the way back in the first episode, Kenna being a rather sex positive character is very rarely demonised for it. The people who call her the king's whore and everything, those they, they are the bad guys, we're not supposed to like them. A lot of the time King Henri is he's sometimes villainised for, for clearly using her a lot. So I, I don't ever get the feeling in these, in these 11 episodes that Kenna is demonised for having sex outside of marriage and actually enjoying sex. So like one of the positives I've found so far is that Kenna is not slut-shamed. Or if she is slut-shamed, she's slut-shamed by people we, we're not supposed to like. I think I'm starting to think that a lot of these episodes are, are told in sort of two-parters. Well, the first six episodes feel like they're being told in two-parters because first one, the main conflict was about Mary and Colin and Susan and Colin. And then that's resolved in the next episode with Colin being killed. Episode 3 and 4 was the whole Thomas of Portugal uh, story arc and then that was resolved in episode 4 and then episode 5 feels like it's a, it's a sort of two-parter regarding the regarding Bassi and the pagans in the woods. So we'll get to that in the next episode. Uh, so now, what was the worst dress in this episode? I have to say it's probably the purple and blue dress that Olivia wears that is probably lent to her by Mary, mostly because Olivia shouldn't be wearing purple. There's a lot of purple on these dresses that should not exist in this time because purple is a very expensive colour in this time. You have to be a certain rank in order to be allowed to wear purple. And I don't think Olivia, as a disgraced courtier, should be allowed to wear purple. <laughs> I thought it was rather fetching. I have passed a law stating that purple cloth or any other cloth embroidered with gold or silver can only be worn by barons, viscounts or higher nobility. And you, Sir William, are only a knight. So that, that's the, the main plot of episode five again. It's, compared with the plots of the other other episodes surrounding it is a bit forgettable because it's setting up a lot of stuff that's going to be resolved in the next few episodes. The whole Amy and the ring and Catherine blackmailing Amy thing, that really does go nowhere as as far as I'm aware in episode 11. But, you know, by episode 11, I haven't seen anything beyond episode 11 yet. I do know a few plot lines such as like, you know, of course Mary and Francois are obviously they're going to get married and um, something regarding Susan and Francois, I think. But we'll find out. I've, I've literally just glimpsed at little at little uh, episode summaries in, uh, of, uh, on Wikipedia, so I, just, I want to be surprised, okay? Because that, that's all I've got in regards to this series. 
that's the only thing that makes uh, watching it bearable most of the time is waiting to be surprised um oh 20 we're like nearly 30 minutes in and my girls have gone flat bloody weather if i'd kept the curlers in overnight maybe they would have stayed never mind at least i got some volume in them that was episode five of rain a chill in the air thank you for watching uh, so the next one is called chosen and we will get more into bassi trying to appease the hydra agents in the woods who worship the chupacabra and uh, if you don't want to miss that make sure you subscribe to the channel and and watch out for the other vlogs about rain and all of my other projects such as stuff about the six wives and other tudor stuff and titanic videos and of course thank you to my patrons who have been supporting me throughout all this uh the first 11 vlogs already on patreon right now so if you are a duke and duchess or king and queen patron you can watch them right away um certain tiers get certain benefits so even if you are the lowest tier or lord and lady tier one pound or one dollar fifty per creation you still get your name in the credits so thank you to my king and queen patrons who get a shout out in these videos alison cuff larissa lady eternal leslie williams and jill my nero Thank you so much. So what do we got next? What do we got next? Let's go, let's go into the next one because why not? <laughs>